So um, you served, which was the mission, your mission president over again, the Hong Kong? It, it was the Southern Far East mission of the okay. church and became the Hong Kong mission at, at the time Marge and I were called. And we had responsibility for Hong Kong and for the church in South Vietnam. Okay. 1971 to 74. So this is when the Vietnam War is under Nixon raging post Lyndon Johnson. It, it's still it's still raging, but at the time we arrived, there had been a decision to reduce uh, to draw down. We were drawing down. We were sending people home. It was incredibly difficult to keep LDS servicemen groups going because uh, out of the blue, <laughs> one of the members of the district presidency would get orders, pack, you're going home tomorrow. Be at Tonsonute Air, Air Base in Saigon at three in the afternoon. Uh, so, yes. Uh, the fighting is still going on, people are dying, but we are drawing down. In, Mar in January of 1973, uh, Elder Hinckley sends me a letter because our government announces that in March, all U.S. military ground troops would be pulled out of the country. And the letter says, President Bradshaw, what are you going to do with the church in Hong Kong <laughs> when the servicemen are gone? We had a branch in Saigon. There were a few dozen local members. Uh, I went to Saigon shortly thereafter and <laughs> was trying to decide how to reply to Elder Hinckley. There's an old French hotel in Saigon. I don't know if it's there anymore. The Hotel Caravelle. There were two or three remnants of the fresh French occupation of French Indochina. There was French bread and French onion soup and the Hotel Caravelle. And President Hinckley had dedicated uh, Vietnam for missionary work for the church from the top floor. There was a restaurant on the top floor. And you could go outside on a balcony and up a few steps to the roof proper. And I did that and looked out over the city and uh, and had an experience whose impact was similar to the one I've described back in my top, top bunk bed in my freshman dorm room. And uh, around what types of feelings or thoughts? The question is, what were we going to do? Oh. And I don't mean to make it over, overly dramatic, but the personal impact on me, John, was very profound. And I left feeling that Heavenly Father was telling me it, things were going to be okay. You go ahead and do what you think you should do. There were no voices. This was an inner perception, an in, inner impression, but it was very real. So uh, on the plane back home, I said, uh, I'm going to tell President Hinckley I want to send missionaries. So I got home and I wrote a two or three page letter to address to Elder Hinckley. I said, I want to send missionaries. We've got a building. There's a refrigerator. Lester Bush is in Saigon. Uh, he's a physician. I didn't say, and he can administer plague shots if necessary. I left that out of the letter. Uh, and I sent it off. Uh, and then I wrote a formal one to the First Presidency in the in the Quorum of the Twelve in the same vein. And less than 10 days, I got a letter back from Elder Hinckley, and he said, I have read your letter to the 
First Presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve, and you will be allowed to send four missionaries from Hong Kong to Saigon. <laughs> and I made some kind of noise. I mean, <laughs> I yelled or bellowed or cried out with happiness, and the elders in the office came running in to see if I was hurt. This is before the war had ended? Not yet. Yeah. Well, I'll explain the, the okay. chronology in a minute. But this is January, this is February-ish of 19, or maybe early March of 1973. So it's maybe a day or two after all of the military have formally gone. Mm. There are lots of Americans still there. And the South Vietnamese are still fighting the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. The war is still raging but we're out of it uh, in terms of U.S. ground troops. And for the first time in the history of war, we were taking the armaments off the battlefield. In the Trang, there's this big deep water harbor, and it was filled with big freighters, you know, and these big, whatever they're called, these big cargo boxes that you can put on a ship and then put on a, uh, a truck and wheel it away. Thousands of them everywhere, and we were taking things back home. Uh, so, uh, you will be permitted to f send four elders. You must write their parents and get their parents' permission. Huh. I picked out four, I sent the letters home. <laughs> Colin Van Orman's father from Lethbridge, Canada, writes and says, well, we read in, Reut in the Reuters news reports every day about the intensity of the fighting, but we trust the Lord, so President Bradshaw, you can send Colin to Saigon. Mm. And I got four of those. Mm. So on April 6th, we thought that was an auspicious day to do something like that. On April 6th, I took four elders to, from Hong Kong to Saigon and we started full-time missionary work. Mm. And we were greeted by the local saints. We had this lovely meal. And the next morning at eight o'clock, the elders started to learn Vietnamese <laughs> from a woman who spoke Cantonese and English and Mandarin and Vietnamese and tutored them half in Cantonese and half in in English and uh, and for a, and for a year before we left, the missionary effort by those four and a few others who joined them rivals Wilford Woodruff at John Benbow's farm. Just a flourish. I don't back away from that <laughs> at all, and. They, and what you mean that is they baptized and they baptized families and we worked our tails off in Hong Kong trying to get husband and wife to join the church and it very rarely happened and it happened nearly every time in Saigon. Mm. Were the people just more humble? And in a year we had a branch of 200 people. Mm. And I got a letter saying, well, what's the, give us a progress report uh, for how the church is doing in Saigon. I made a recording of the kids saying, I am a child of God in Vietnamese, and I sent it and said, this is how we're doing. <laughs> that was my report. <laughs> and we had a Vietnamese branch president and first counselor. I, I set apart Lester Bush as the uh, second counselor. Mm -hmm. And when I set Lester apart, that's another experience where I have to testify that there was divinity involved. And Lester and Yvonne Bush did as much for the growth of the church in South Vietnam as was possible. And their kindness and their devotion and their sensitivity was extraordinary. Real quick, for the benefit of some of my listeners, a lot maybe not know who Lester Bush was, but I, I remember him to be the man who wrote that dialogue article 
outlining the history of, of blacks in the priesthood, uncovering the fact that Joseph had given the priesthood to Elijah Abel and maybe a few others. And many credit that as being an important historical work that might have led to uh, President Hinckley seeking a revelation about blacks in the priesthood a few years later. Would he have been writing that while he was in Vietnam with you? Yes. Uh, so I can tell that I'm smiling and there's a big story here and I don't know how much time we have to devote to details, but I'll try to be brief. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, Lester's parents joined the church. Lester's father worked for the CIA. Le Lester's mother uh, w w would have been a, a stake president, except for her gender. Uh, she uh, was devoted to the Book of Mormon. Uh, Lester went to medical school in Virginia, uh, came to Salt Lake to intern, always had a historical bent, got access to church historical records, be, sort of before the doors got closed and padlocked, and uh, found every single scrap of paper that he could that had any reference to African Americans and Mormonism. And that was the basis for that dialogue piece. And he was negotiating, negotiating with Bob Reese, who was the editor of Dialogue at the time, to see that it got published. And he wrote to the church and said, I'm, I'm, uh, this is the manuscript that I intend to publish. He had to go from Saigon to the U.S. to shepherd a, a uh, alcoholic member of the State Department back home. While he was in Salt Lake, he met with Elder Packer and with Joseph Anderson. The journalist. Uh, uh, Lester Bush met with them about his dialogue okay. piece. Right. Um, I took Marge to Saigon a couple of times and one time she got off the plane and had a dialogue in her hands and Lester <laughs> was flabbergasted and and you you read you guys read that? Yes, we do and that was part of the bond between us. It was, it was, uh, we were intellectual kin. So, uh, when Lester got back, he sat, I, I visited again, he told me details about his visit with Elder Packer. Uh, that story is recorded in the Journal of Mormon History. I don't remember the year, maybe 85-ish. Um, so, for a year, the missionaries proselytized. This is how they got people to teach. They stood on a corner, two of them, with a map of Saigon and a, tried to look lost. <laughs> and within two minutes, somebody would come up and say, can I help you? And they would say, yes, we're trying to find such and such a street they already knew about. The man would, or woman would walk with them in the direction of their alleged destination and they had a cottage meeting arranged. <laughs> you know, I make it sound like it was without concern. It, there was a lot of concern. When I would go to Saigon and drive from Tonsonut Air Base to our building, I would go through the red light district of Saigon and there were brothels everywhere in big neon lights and there were little children and a large proportion of them were, were uh, black Asian children and they were anathema to the Vietnamese. A little child with Negroid blood was not accepted. And, and you would go to the black market in Saigon and get, and buy, if you wish, Black & Decker electric tools stolen off the 
quays off the harbor sides from equipment sent into the from the United States for the to help the war effort or to help build the the Vietnamese economy. There were little kids with both of their legs blown off, uh, wheeling themselves around on a little cart with wheels, selling cigarettes. And not everybody in Saigon loved America. And I'm sending four 20-year-old kids to mine. Maybe, you know, <laughs> mission presidents don't know everything that happens to their missionaries. And I've learned a whole lot of interesting things su in subsequent years. <laughs> and maybe there were things that happened to them in Saigon, uh, threats uh, that, I, that I don't know about. But I'm not aware of any serious threat to their safety. And they built the church. And uh, we taught the missionary program at the time was this uh, loose leaf with pictures. And um, they wanted to get, have me use the, the English version pictures. And I said, over my dead body, we're having pictures of Vietnamese people in the Vietnamese flip chart. And Elder Christensen was a terrific photographer and he made duplicates of all of the scenes with Vietnamese people and there was a Vietnamese convert couple paying tithing in Vietnamese money <laughs> to a Vietn Vietnamese branch president and all right so it went really well for a year and we had 200 and then there and then Marge and I went home a new mission president came it lasted for another year so almost two years to the day from when I brought those first four, you have that remarkable picture of the helicopter lifting off the roof yes. of the U.S. Embassy with people hanging on the rope ladder trying to get away. And before that happened, uh, we evacuated the missionaries, um, destroyed all the records. We were afraid of what ultimately did happen in some instances, and that is that the Vietnamese members of the church would be targeted by the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong when they came into Saigon because of their association with Westerners, with Americans. President Tay, th there was a meeting on Sunday. He took the whole branch to the airport. They got through Ted Tuttle's Theodore Tuttle was a member of the first quorum of 70. His son worked in the White House. They got a transport plane for the Mormon Vietnamese branch. They all got on the airplane. There were other people, he, President Tay learned that other people had gone to the branch building were waiting for him. He went back, brought them back to the airport. He couldn't get in. His family and the rest left. He left on the plane out of Saigon, he was left. He was put in a re-education camp, several, suffered terrible deprivation for two years, got out, um, managed to get on a little fishing boat and leave Saigon for Bangkok with bullets whizzing over his head. Is he an American or Vietnamese? Local? Vietnamese. Okay. He's now here with his family. He sent a letter from the re-education camp to his wife. It came to Marge and I. We went down to find his wife in a mobile home on Center Street uh, in Provo on the west side of I-15. And she read this letter. It was essentially, I may never see you again, and I love you, and I love my children, and I don't know if I'm going to survive. Uh, We translated the Book of Mormon in Vietnamese. <laughs> I'm laughing because I did not have the best of relationships with the people, with one of the people who ran the church translation office. We, <laughs> uh, we butted heads over several issues, like the translation of the Doctrine and Covenants in Chinese and the translation of the Book of Mormon in Vietnamese. 
and he, we, had, we got a draft finished. A wonderful woman who was uh, an heir to the royal family of Vietnam was the primary translator. He said, well, send us the translation and we'll review it in Salt Lake. Who will review it for you, Brother Coombs? Well, our staff. Does your staff know Vietnamese? We'll take care of it. Well, I came to Hong Kong. I made 40 Xerox copies. I didn't tell him about it. I made 40 Xerox copies, sent the manuscript to him to review, took the 40 Xerox copies back to Saigon. <laughs> and I'm sure it was filled with problems. Didn't matter. People read it, people believed, people joined the church. Members of the church had the Book of Mormon. It took us decades to do it in Hong Kong. Well, um, what's do, the, do you want to switch the direction of the, the conversation? Church, just for fun, what's the church like today in Vietnam? Do we know? There are uh, church service missionaries, couples who perform humanitarian service. Um, I got a letter three or four years ago from uh, a woman in Hong Kong who with her husband were serving missions as attorneys. They were trying to recreate the history of the legal relationship between the church and the Vietnamese government at the time we were there to see if we could uh, normalize relationships. Uh, there's something a little bit more going on now than that, but I'm not privy to the details. Okay. And the hope is that somewhere there's still some families who, who have maintained the, the testimony and, and the convictions that were gained. Most of them left. Most of them left on that plane. The rest left uh, one family at a time later. Some of them remain. So... Uh, I, I don't think the church will rebuild on a foundation of the earlier group. Was it hard to build something so beautiful to see it? Must have been terrible. John, it was extraordinary. I was in, we had, we had three military districts. There was Saigon, there was Nha Trang, sort of in the middle of the country, and then there was Da Nang, which is just below the demilitarized zone. I was in all of those places when, when we resumed bombing of Hanoi and the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The, the, the airfield at Da Nang was like O'Hare at the busiest time of the busiest day of the year. And, and I was ha having to wait there to get transport around the country. And you would see the fighter planes in tiers landing every 40 seconds and you'd see helicopters everywhere and big transport planes and these weird <laughs> planes that you that I'd never seen anything the like of before and they were probably spy planes they were they were getting information you know they were intelligence gathering vehicles uh, so it was extraordinary. And then Watergate was, uh, was uh, unraveling. <laughs> and the only time we'd hear anything much about, it, I'd read something in the Stars and Stripe, the, the military newspaper when I was there, and a little bit in the Hong Kong English newspapers. But when we came home in 1974, I, Martin and I had to re-educate ourselves to the whole thing. And, uh, uh, I, I went with the LDS branch president in the Trang out to a place where there was a, a thirty feet barb a thirty feet screened fence between the fishing village on one side and the American base on the other side. I. I would see these little plastic packets. I'd kick them as we walked along. What are those, President? Uh, oh, those are packages that contained heroin. There was, a, there was a big barracks there where American GIs were undergoing cold turkey withdrawal from heroin addiction 
because they wouldn't admit to their addiction before they left the country. The rule was, if you own up, we take care of you, we hospitalize you, we help you get over this. If not, we throw you in this room and you do it on your own. And it was filled with people. And they called this place the meat market. And American GIs would line, on one, line up on one side of the fence and the fi women from the fishing village on the other side. And, and a man would go by and say, I want that one and I want this. It was the meat market. The, the single most frequent comment by people in, in Vietnam was, how short are you? Meaning, how many days do you have left in this hellhole before you have to go, before you get to go home? Um, I seem to recall you, you uh, being able to counsel some of the soldiers. Yes. Are you comfortable sharing maybe a story or two about what it was like for those LDS kids to be participating in that war? Well, it's a story in, in contrast. So I think for the overwhelming majority of LDS men in the military, the experience may not have been good for them, but they survived it strengthened in a moral way. And for others, it was weakened in a moral sense. So th there was sexual promiscuity, there was drug addiction. In my first, I went to Saigon as GS-17, the equivalent of a brigadier general because I was the president of the church in Vietnam. We had in Da Nang, we had this uh, conference meeting. The men came in and put their, their, their rifles, leaned them up against the back wall and went in to prepare the sacrament. One of the, one of the branch presidents was the mortician um, first time I ever saw body bags. Um, and the testimony meetings at, at these places were unbelievable. Aaron Milligan got permission to dye his garments green so he could wear them instead of, instead of uh, military uh, standard issue underwear. He lived with the Hamlet chiefs. He spoke Vietnamese. He asked to go back to Vietnam. He loved the people. They loved him. He didn't know whether he'd go, go home and see his wife and, a new, and their second newborn child. Um, when you hear Aaron Milligan bear your testimony, it's not the same as some of the sort of frivolous expressions. I, I, I don't mean to put down anybody's attempt to bear testimony in a testimony meeting, but sometimes it's less meaningful than others. And Aaron Milligan's testimony was as meaningful as they come. Uh, at, the end of, at the end of that meeting, I had several interviews. The first was with a young man I'd met before the meeting started. He was at the back of the hall. He looked sick. He was sick. He was going through heroin withdrawal. His brother, a returned missionary from England, his brother was a pilot who'd been shot down and killed weeks before. The second was uh, an LDS guy from, who'd married an English woman in the church, and during his military service, she'd been unfaithful to him. He had, he had not much left of any kind of self-respect. And I'm sitting there trying desperately to find some words of instruction and comfort. Uh, the next is a young kid who looks like he's 15. He, he, he plays the piano for the meetings. I, uh, I find, he comes in and tells me that on his R&R &R back home uh, two months before, he went to bed with his girlfriend's mother. Well. Uh, 
we can get ourselves in <laughs> unbelievable conditions of trouble. And so I had some experience trying to help people like this. In, in, in Saigon, there was a kid who, whose hair was long and he had all the beads. He, he could have been walking the, the streets of San Francisco during the same time. Uh, uh, but he was in the military and his buddy had taken an AK-47 round right in the forehead two days earlier. He was dying in the hospital. This kid had two older, this young man had two older brothers who had gone AWOL from the army. They were in Canada. He was holding on to the church by the ends of his fingernails. Uh, he'd read a talk that Duff had given and it was printed in the ensign. The talk was about inclusion and diversity and he was clinging to that. Had a girlfriend in St. George and, and between her letters and what little he could find that helped him in church magazines, he was still with us. What do you tell a soldier who's struggling with the realities of having to kill as part of his duties, yet he's believing in the Prince of Peace? I don't know, John. Uh, people, Latter-day Saints and otherwise, have to deal with that, and people deal with it in different ways. And when they deal with it as honestly as they know how, I think you have to honor their response, no matter what it is. Still